It's Entertainment Law Update, episode 165 for February of 2024. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Entertainment Law Update from Los Angeles, California. I am Gordon Firemark. And from the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, I'm Tamara Bennett. And we are so glad that you are here with us for this, our podcast about entertainment law, where each month we pull together a roundup of legal and business news stories and share our opinions and commentary and analysis. And uh, Tamara, you are just back from a, what looked like a wonderful vacation in uh, New Zealand, yes? I am. I mean, we could spend the whole podcast just talking about my uh, the the Johnny and Tamara excellent adventure in a camper van on the South Island of New Zealand. So, uh, wow, it sounds it like a lot was, of fun. It was amazing. It really was the trip of a, a lifetime to go, and we didn't have enough time. <laughs> So you just never have enough time. We still didn't get to see so many things while we were there. I saw one of your posts on social and I thought to myself, I wonder if she's going to come back from this trip. Oh, (laughs) it it was questionable. We actually set date. We had to fly home. But other than that, everything was pretty fluid. So we extended our camper van by one day. And I think if we have a regret, it's that we didn't just extend the camper van for the rest of the trip. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and switching to the North Island and doing some Airbnbs. Mm-hmm. It was just, uh, it was delightful. The people are wonderful. And it the South Island of New Zealand is like something I suspect most people have never seen before. Well, that's wonderful for, for all the, uh, uh, the hassles that travel involves. It really is sort of a, a, a joy to go someplace you've never been before and explore and, and uh, take in some, you know, new oh, sites yeah. and new culture and all that kind of stuff. So I, or, I envy yeah. for you. The hours of, for, for the hours of travel, it is it is worth it in the end to be able to, oh, to sit, see and do that. I'm so thankful we, we've gotten to do that. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I don't have any exciting news for myself this last month or so. <laughs> so uh, we'll just get right into the show. This episode of Entertainment Law Update is sponsored by JD Supra, the leading platform in professional services content marketing, helping lawyers to turn their expertise into to networking opportunities, media visibility, and new business. J.D. Supra publishes and distributes blog posts, articles, podcasts, videos, and other thought leadership to hundreds of thousands of subscribers on a daily basis, and that includes business leaders, in-house counsel, media members, the C-suite, and others who have a need-to-know interest in legal, regulatory, and compliance matters. J.D. Super clients not only enjoy wide readership of their thought leadership, but they are also provided with the data and the tools to turn that visibility into marketing and business development success. And you can find out much more about JD Supra by visiting resources.jdsupra.com. And we're glad to have JD Supra on the team. So that's great. Well, let's jump right into uh, some of the big news for the last few weeks. Uh, first off, the grand jury has indicted Alec Baldwin in that uh, 2021 fatal shooting on the set of the movie Rust in New Mexico. Several criminal prosecutions have come out of that. The first is at trial right now. The armorer on the film, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, is being tried for her involvement and failures that led to the death of um, Helena Hutchinson. And uh, the assistant director, David Halls, has pled guilty to unsafe handling of a firearm, and he has received a probation sentence. And now, Alec Baldwin has been indicted on involuntary manslaughter charges. Basically, Baldwin was rehearsing with a gun that unexpectedly went off, resulting in Helena Hutchins' death and injuring uh, Joel Souza as well, the director. Uh, And so the indictment comes after there's been a bit of back and forth with the case, especially when a new analysis on the gun that was used, um, special prosecutors, after digging into the new information, did decide to bring the case to the grand jury and (laughs) blammo, we have an indictment. Forgive me for being glib about that. Baldwin's defense team is gearing up for a fight. They promise they're looking forward to proving the case in court. But that new information that came out is that Baldwin has always said that he didn't actually pull the trigger, just pulled back the hammer and the gun fired. Uh, But now with this charge hanging over him, he could be facing some serious time. And the kicker is, despite that insistence that he didn't pull the trigger, a new analysis of the gun suggests otherwise saying that, you know, after examination of the gun, the trigger had to have been pulled for the gun to fire the way that it did. And that's why the case was reopened against 
Mr. Baldwin. So as you can imagine, the whole situation sparks civil lawsuits from Hutchins' family as well and others connected to the tragedy. Everybody's pointing finger about who's responsible for ensuring safety on set, and the answer is really everybody is responsible for that. Uh, but despite all this, the Rust movie production did pick back up uh, toward the end of last year and finished filming in Montana, and Hutchins' widower is involved as an executive producer. So at some point, we will get to see the movie, um, and uh, you know, all of this will factor into the publicity around the film, I'm sure. So it's a tragedy, it really is, and um, you know, wouldn't wish this kind of thing on any of the people involved. Hey, well, and I, there's been, have there been changes into the rules and regulations on handling? I and think the, firearms. I mean, surely that will continue to. Be uh, you know, I think protected. each state has its own rules. And so it's sort of, I, mean, I imagine many states have changed the rules, but you know, the best practices and, and the, the rules were already in place. I think what's going on here is that they weren't properly adhered to in the first place in this film. So it may not be that there's a rule change needed so much as better training, better supervision and oversight. Uh, I would just think a rule would be there's never live ammo on a set. Well, I think that Seems is like rule. that would be a rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, that should be adhered to. So, Well, um, we have another interesting it's kind of a surprisingly basic case that came up here around the uh, what was called the blank form doctrine, right? Um, the Eighth Circuit has uh, has uh, had a, a case, a ruling in in um, <laughs> the plaintiff's name is Ronald Ragan R A G A N Jr. versus Berkshire Hathaway Automotive. I keep wanting uh, yes, to say Ronald Reagan. I I read that incorrectly the first three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as well and had to keep going back. <laughs> yeah. So it's an Eighth Circuit uh, appeal from a district court's ruling uh, that a customer intake form designed for car dealerships to help in their sales processes lacked the requisite originality for copyright protection. Ragan had designed the form called a guest sheet. Uh, back in 1999, he registered it with the Copyright Office, received registration, but... Um, Claim, and he claimed ownership of this guest sheet, and the and he accused a particular auto dealership of infringement of that in an original lawsuit. It was originally dismissed on jurisdictional issues because Ber Berkshire Hathaway Automotive had acquired the dealership, and then it continued using the guest sheet, mm -hmm. and that's what led him to file the second infringement suit. Um, and the district court then granted Hathaway's motion for judgment on the pleadings arguing that the guest sheet lacked copyrightability, and that's what prompts this appeal. So Ragan said, look, it's, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it is creative enough, it has enough. The Eighth Circuit disagreed. They said it exhibits minimal creativity, constituted a basic customer intake sheet. Despite his assertions about the form's sophistication, the court said, no, it's very simple. It's basic questions, prompts, and checkboxes, uh, totaling fewer than 100 words. And... Uh, the court cited the 1991 Feist Publications versus Rural Telephone Service Supreme Court ruling and reiterated the requirement that the work possess a minimal degree of originality, that is, independent creation and some level of creativity, in order to be copyrightable. Ragan's argument that the selection and arrangement of words on the guest sheet demonstrated originality, the court didn't buy it, they emphasized the need for creativity beyond mere selection and highlighted that the sheet primarily functioned as a tool for collecting information rather than conveying information. So Ragan also contended that the copyright registration certificate afforded it a presumption of validity. Eighth Circuit said the challenge to the form's copyrightability could be based solely on an examination of the form regardless of the registration's presumption. So rebutted the presumption just by looking at the form and making an analysis. The decision underscores the significance of demonstrating substantial creativity in order to secure copyright protection and that mere selection and arrangement of words isn't going to be sufficient. Uh, the court made the distinction. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I'm kind of shocked it got a registration to start with. I mean, mm. it really is a very generic intake form I, think, I don't think if someone filed that today i think on examination it would be immediately refused 
I think so too. I think you know the, the intervening twenty five years, things have changed a bit in how the copyright office looks at registration applications, and um, for better or worse, in many cases. <laughs> but uh, in yeah. this one, yeah, I think that he was trying to register a basic form that probably shouldn't have ever received registration. So, but that interesting distinction between information gathering and conveyance really gets to f the role of you know functional function and purpose in determining copyrightability also. So it's interesting. Well, and it was just, we don't really have a, like a, I guess there is a useful article exception to copyright registration, which is more the, the spoon versus the hmm. ornate design on the handle of the spoon, spoon, not protected ornate yeah. design would be, but and I, and I, this is a conversation I have often with clients is, you know, are the intake form or the way in which we gather this information or the particular questions we ask to a customer or a client or a student, you know, that should be protected by copyright. And so often it's a very similar situation. It's just, it's very general information that's being pulled together in this case on a form. So I'm, I'm wondering, and I would state, so maybe if it was more than the form, it was a packet of information, there could be sufficient originality or creativity in, in more <laughs> than fill in the blank form yeah, that if might there be were, protected. Yeah. If there were instructions on how to use it and, and, you know, explaining what what the information means and how it goes in you know that yeah but in this case it was really just let's get this person's name and phone number and contact information and what they're interested in so we can follow up with them and, you know very it, it, from the sounds of things it's a very basic thing i think that blank forms doctrine uh, excuse me not the, the useful articles doctrine is an interesting one uh, although i think it could be a dangerous slope to go down when you're talking about a form because i would say almost any form no matter how creative could be characterized as a useful article. Sure. So then you get into well, <laughs> yeah. is it the scroll work on the on the spoon or is it the spoon itself? You know, what is what are we right. talking about here? So But I really one, I was just surprised this case went this far. Yeah. So there there obviously were other factors that must have been driving this. But then two, I, I'm not aware nothing was jumping out in my recollection of a previous decision in which the case the court rebutted that presumption of prima facie evidence of validity of what was in the copyright application and of the work being valid. So yeah. if you file your copyright application before publication or within five years after publication, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's this prima facie evidence of putting into the record mm -hmm. or registration and the court just said, mm, we just don't think it was valid, even yeah. if they're you've over, like you said, overcome that yeah. prima facie. I don't evidence. remember whether the whether the Feist case had been registered and they and the court overruled or whatever. But yeah, I don't still, either. Yeah, on the facts of that case, uh, it was a phone book, right? So, white pages section of a phone book. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. it's got to be more than the blanks on a form, and that's mm -hmm. the conversation I have often with clients, even to the point of. You know, you, you may or may not be, you could be gathering confidential information. Maybe there's some other ways you can protect it, but copyright probably isn't the way you're going to protect that. Exactly right. Exactly right. Well, we're going to move over to our little AI corner. We have a couple of stories in there. Tamara, why don't you take the first of these? Yeah, a couple of cases we've been talking about for the last off and on for the last few months in the few mm -hmm. episodes, but the Silverman, Sarah Silverman and other authors have, uh, unfortunately for them, their claims against OpenAI and Meta have mm -hmm. been primarily dismissed. Um, they, there were identical lawsuits filed in the Northern District of California, San Francisco Division, as well as... I'm not sure where the other one was I filed. As don't I don't yeah. Okay. <laughs> For, forgive me, guys. We've got two lawsuits going out there. Uh, Silverman's lawsuits, as she's the lead plaintiff, focused on open AI and Meta's unlicensed use of the author's works to develop their systems and their alleged profiting from the use of that uh, copyrightable work, basically feeding in their 
their literary works uh, to uh, language train <laughs> their AI systems. Um, one of the boldest and biggest claims was that the AI systems are themselves the system is an infringing derivative work mm -hmm. uh, made possible only by information extracted from this copyrighted material of third parties. Uh, the U.S. District Judge in the suit against Meta said that argument is, quote, nonsensical. There's no way to understand the language learning models themselves as recasting or, a, or an adaptation of any of the plaintiff's books. Um, the judge in the open AI case also dismissed on similar grounds, as well as dismissing claims for vicarious copyright infringement, negligence, and unjust enrichment. Uh, so there's also a claim that the, when a prompt is entered by a third party and results are yielded, so I type in something that then open AI or chat spits out a response that that output from the platform constitutes an infringement of the work. And then I kind of really question, and so did the judge. I like it when I we agree. You know, is there really substantial similarity? A fundamental contention that was argued is whether they can, the authors can really substantiate this copyright infringement claim because there's not identical material, and I would say substantially similar material that's being spit back out by the AI tools. Um, note that in I think in all of these AI cases we're going to talk about, there's been no dismissal on direct copyright infringement. Uh, but the judge did dismiss claims uh, offering evidence saying that Silverman didn't offer any evidence that any of the outputs could be understood as recasting, transforming, or adapting the books of the plaintiffs, and that, that there was no derivative infringement they would need to inlet allege and ultimately prove that the outputs incorporated some portion of the plaintiff's book and they just haven't been able to meet that standard. Uh, again, there was no output that was substantially similar, but the plaintiffs have been granted leave to amend. So in addition to the direct infringement claims remaining, what's open in this case is still the unfair competition claim brought under California law, mm -hmm. which makes me kind of give a little pause to say, don't we have a preemption question that anything that really sounds like unfair sounds an unfair competition actually would sound under copyright law? But we will see what the court has to say on that. Um, so anyway, the suits followed another class action filed by the same same attorneys regarding copyright for image infringement on images gen generated by Stability AI, which is another AI case we've mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah. in the past, and which we're going to talk a little bit about right now, and already addresses that preemption issue. Yeah, yeah. But before we go there, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in is that these cases seem to be focusing on the output side of these AI tools use, rather than on the copying that has to go on in order to ingest the material in the first place. And I guess there's some wrinkles in the copyright law that go back to the probably the 70s and 80s dealing with computer technology and and that need to copy the software into the memory of the computer and so there were exceptions built into the law. I suspect that's why but I'm I'm puzzled that that we're not talking about the the, the wholesale copying on the input end of well, things. I think that's the direct infringement claims that do remain. Okay, maybe that's it, yeah. That, that's what I think, is that they did not move or failed on their motion to dismiss yeah. on the claim of direct infringement. Yeah. I suspect An there are facts. Yeah, An another <laughs> thing... That, on that. The, another thing that comes into my mind here, and, and that I think, well, I know it's influencing my approach when I'm dealing with people who are putting content up on websites that they own and control is making sure that the terms of use specifically say you may not use this to train AI, oh. those kinds of things. So then you at least have a contract claim. At practice work. pointer, yeah. big practice pointer. Um, I think that, and I think that probably the New York Times case will look at something like that. I think that their terms of service probably did have some restriction on the use you know, for commercial purposes and things like that. So I, I, there may be other kinds of claims at work here that we can expect to see used in cases dealing with AI going forward. But it's something that I think most of us just were overlooking up until the well, technology came out, you know? 
And I, I love that as far as terms of use for websites. Um, great, great practice tip. I've actually been, um, as I'm working through recording artist contracts, talent contracts, uh, mm -hmm. especially those that may be of a legacy nature, yeah. uh, really dealing with and putting in language, you can't use this to train. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. I think we have to do that. And, um, and, and, and I, it's really interesting <clears throat> to me as people kind of, you know, everybody's kind of in their own lane as to the area of law they practice. And I don't think a lot of folks, even within the entertainment industry who maybe aren't thinking about right of the right of publicity mm -hmm. aspect a lot of times, yeah. um, in addition to the copyright aspect. Yeah, I, no, I think this... That's a, that's a big concern. Yeah. And I think that enum, enumerating the scope of whatever rights granted in a more discreet way is going to become more important here so that, again, other new technologies will eventually come along that if we're not defending or, or building up the shields now, we may see the same thing happening again in 10 years with holography or something like that. Right. So. Um, All media now known and hereafter developed. We're going <laughs> to. Well, we may not need to stop using that or at least That's suggesting right. that in the event of a use in this fashion, there will be an additional license for you know, something. We'll have, we'll have to, yeah. when, when we have the bargaining power to do so, <laughs> we'll have to make that happen. So you, right. you alluded to the other AI case that's moving forward. Um, same court. This is the identical case, but dealing with the images. This is Anderson versus Stability Eye et al. Also in the Northern District of California, another dismissal of claims. Uh, more messages about the training AI, this time on the side of the artist. Um, we've previously talked about this. The case of Anderson v. Stability AI involved a web comic artist that had discovered the AI had been trained to create works in her specific art style leaving style out of the <laughs> equation for a second. So Stability is the creator of st Stable Diffusion, a software program that um, has downloaded, according to the plaintiffs, has downloaded or otherwise acquired copies of billions of copyrighted images without the permission of the creators uh, and used them as training images to act as a software library for a variety of visual generative artificial intelligence platforms, including Dream Studio, Dream Up, uh, Mid Journey, uh, all owned by different companies. So they're all defendants in this case. In October last year, the court largely granted AI generators um, move to dismiss the suit, but left a few key claims to move forward. Among those claims were copyright infringement, right of publicity, unfair competition, and breach of contract. There you go. Against DeviantArt and MidJourney. Um, concluding that the allegations uh, on the other claims that were dismissed were defective in numerous respects. So... Um, a claim for right of publicity wasn't reasserted when the suit was refiled, but DeviantArt moved for its motion to strike the claim for good anyway and uh, to dismiss the claim under the state California anti-slap statute. The artists are arguing that the AI companies were abusing the statute, and the judge took the artist's side this time, denying dismissal under the anti-slap law, finding that the public interest exemption is met here. So he noted that the claim was initially dismissed because the suit failed to substantiate allegations that the companies used the names of the artists who brought the complaint to advertise the products and the plaintiffs had been able to had they been able to allege those facts they would have stated their claims um, but that doesn't undermine that their original right of publicity claims were based on the use of their names in connection with the sale or promotion of dream up um, a type of claim that would undoubtedly enforce the public policy in California that protects against misappropriation of names and likenesses. It's interesting that it's about the names. So similar to Silverman's case, the Anderson case's claims of direct infringement was allowed to proceed based on allegations that the company used copyrighted images without permission. There's that ingestion question mm -hmm. in creating the AI technology. So, um, so the anti slap yeah, motion. When... Yeah, go ahead, sir. Well, I was just saying, I'm not sure when the next when the next uh, filings are due on that to move forward. But yeah. I wonder if we'll see. Have you seen a change in how courts are responding to anti slap motions? I haven't been paying that have close attention. Overused. Well, I know that uh, wasn't there a change in Texas's anti slap 
law just proposed in the legislature last week or something like that. We'll be reporting on it when and if it passes the other chamber and into the governor's office. Uh, I don't know. Again, yeah, there was a feeling by I was in New Zealand, but I think right. there has there has been kind of this movement for revision mm -hmm. to our anti-slap law. Well, you know, it, it is an interesting balance of of power issue where you know big companies that that bring these slap suits feeling like well it gives too much power to the little guy we're trying to intimidate at least this is my perspective my political perspective is we're trying to intimidate these guys and you're making it too hard for us <laughs> um and i think you know in california it's a there's a different approach to uh you know different different political view of these things and and here um the the legislature is all about protecting the little guy so um I, here i haven't seen it in california being an issue and and uh, but I, my understanding is that there is a move in texas's legislature to um loosen things a little bit with the anti-slap yeah. make it a little harder for plaintiffs uh, for defendants to bring these motions successfully well so. and if something changes on it we'll have to have our friend and colleague brent turman oh, join yeah. us because i know he's been uh, involved in a variety of different mm -hmm. things related to anti-slap so we'll, yeah. we'll get brent to give us a good update yeah. <laughs> well if and when we need it so right right well we're going to move out of the ai corner, uh, the AI cases here, but I just want to sort of be transparent that this next story, the summary we're working from, uh, I, I used AI to put it together. So what I did was I actually put in the, um, a, a couple of news reports and the opinion in the case, and I asked AI to give me a conversational style summary. And so here I'm going to, um, read that to you <laughs> and you'll see what we got so, so do you want to share what what uh, uh program you used so i used a customized uh gpt you know in chat gpt if you if you pay for a subscription it lets you create sort of custom uh tools and the one i have is called podcast prodigy and i use it for uh, outlining and creating uh, uh ideation for for some of the stuff i do and uh, in this case i said hey give me a conversational style thing so um the case is uh, sony music entertainment versus cox communications you may remember we reported on this some time back sony music entertainment and a group of other record companies and publishers had taken cox to court over copyright infringement allegations the fight was about suing individuals for downloading I'm sorry, it wasn't about suing individuals for downloading music illegally. It was about whether Cox, as the internet service provider, could be held accountable for the infringement actions of its users. Cox is the internet service provider. Some of its users were caught sharing files illegally. And uh, the music company said Cox should be responsible since it provided the service used for the illegal downloads and shares. And there were some DMCA takedown notices. And the big complaint really was that Cox wasn't uh, didn't have a, a, a proper policy of uh, three strikes and you're out or, you know, some kind of a repeat <laughs> infringer. Uh, I think it was 13 strikes policy. Is <laughs> something like that. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, it was 13 strikes. <laughs> right, right. So the law provides for Internet service providers like Cox to avoid liability um, under the DMCA if they play by the rules, and that is that they have to have the policy in place to deal with repeat infringers. And uh, previously, the court had called out Fox, uh, Cox excuse me, for not doing enough to stop infringement by repeat infringers, so they were not allowed to hide behind that shield, and the case had gone to trial, and the jury thought, yeah, Cox contributed to the infringement and profited from it. So the jury said um, Cox is liable for contributory in, uh, infringement, for contributing to and profiting from copyright infringement. And they came back with that billion dollar damages award that we reported on, what, if, probably a year and a half, two years ago, right? But the story doesn't end there. Cox did file an appeal, and the appellate court has now ruled in a mixed response. They agreed. Cox was in the wrong for contributing to the infringement, but they didn't agree that Cox had profited directly from the infringement. They said they didn't directly make money from the illegal downloads themselves just from providing the internet service, and that's not the same. So they threw out the, the part of the verdict about Cox profiting from the infringement and, uh, and said that there needs to be a new trial to figure out the damages. So it's a nuanced decision between 
um, you know, where is the line between vicarious infringement and contrib contributory infringement? And um, the court said, look, the, the, the distinction is here. Cox is liable for the contributory infringement, but not for vicarious liability, essentially agreeing that they contributed to the infringement, failed to effectively manage repeat infringers, but they disagreed that, about the direct profit, and that was why they vacated this billion-dollar judgment. So back to a jury, a trial court and a jury on the damages question at this point. Yeah, and this is something just longtime listeners know that we've been talking about this for almost well, we're pushing a decade. Yeah. So these were acts, alleged acts of infringement that happened between 2013 and 2014. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was that the height of illegal downloading of music. I don't know. It's probably still in the height of it. <laughs> Who knows <laughs> these days? But I mean, the suit was filed in 2018. Uh, the appeal got filed in 2021. So yeah. it is a battle that both sides are still feel is very viable to keep fighting. Yeah. Um, and then kind of two prongs on the vicarious liability. Mm -hmm. uh, it must have the right and ability to control infringing mm -hmm. activity and a direct financial benefit from the infringement. So, you know, it kind of makes me go back and think about all of our YouTube and red flag and they get 13 yeah. strikes. I mean, there was knowledge and this isn't even coming up with the vicarious liability was, was knowledge an issue. It was just, were they controlling it and were they gaining from it? So, well, I wonder, could the jury have, have laid the entire billion dollar judgment. After all, it was a statutory damages, one hundred fifty thousand dollar in you know willful infringement times ten thousand infringed works. I think was how the calculus came, is whatever it came out. Could they have laid that all on the contributory and just not not? Does the vicarious liability matter? And could they could we come back in and still have a billion dollar judgment without the vicarious liability component or? Because it's a contributory infringement, do you then apportion the liability across the actual infringers and the provider? I wonder if that's going to be what we have I to suspect it's got to be. And, and I wonder if on the jury instructions they had to allocate. Hmm. Maybe, yeah, that's probably what happened. Or, or, or they didn't allocate, and because it was not allocated, they had to vacate the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I mean, and I think that this ruling is correct. You know, they didn't derive that direct financial benefit from the infringement. Not like they were turning around and selling it or they, were, they weren't marketing their service as, here, here's how you can get all these songs. <laughs> right? It was just, hey, well, get your internet from unless, us. Unless people knew, hey, if I get Cox, they don't shut us down. You know, was, would that make it valuable to mm -hmm. use that service provider? But also especially at that yeah. time period, you were really limited in who you could have for a service provider anyway. Right. You yeah. know, depending on where you lived. So mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe there's a whole well, you know, conversation. John, our, our, our managing editor, put in an interesting note here. He, he pointed out that, you know, this is a 21st century problem and a 21st century case, but the court actually put a lot of its analysis on this vicarious liability situation on the Shapiro case from 1963. Um, and it was a, an analogy of landlords and tenants versus the owner of a dance hall and a band. And, you know, where the entity can supervise and control the platform like a dance hall and a band is one thing, but the landlord doesn't have control over what the tenants do inside the apartment. So um, that lack of supervision is what takes out the vicarious yeah. liability. So that's crazy. They have to go back 60 years for a case yeah <laughs> <laughs> before anybody even thought about actually i mean you you didn't even have cassette recorders in in the 1960s nobody was making bootleg oh, tapes right. or even i mean you know, the, so. the beatles were re-recording over all of their four tracks and compressing in 1960 right. or were they even doing that yet in 1963 so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we will uh, keep you posted on the outcome as the jury, as the as the lower court deals with the case. Who knows? There may be a settlement at this point. Um, 
now that a billion dollars is off the table, at least for the moment. So we'll see what happens. Keep you posted. Take the next one. So, yeah. So I always love when we get to talk about tattoo art. I I don't know why that's (laughs) intriguing to me, but but it always is. So uh, in January 27th of 2024, a jury ruled that celebrity tattoo artist Kat Von D was not liable for the, uh, the tattoo she of, of an image of Miles Davis that she inked onto a client. She used as a reference work, a photograph by Jeffrey, this is where I should have had my glasses on, Sedlick. Sedlick, yeah, Sedlick. Sedlick. Uh, Yeah, so anyway, the plaintiff photographer in 2021 sued, filed a complaint against Kat claiming that her celebrity tattoo uh, based upon or referencing his photo of Miles Davis uh, was an infringement in addition to the actual tattoo art that she created and tattooed attached to her client. Uh, She also, I guess, in the process of of, uh, placing the tattoo, inking the tattoo, had photographs uh, of her on social media putting the tattoo on as well as having this image of Miles Davis in the background that was protected by copyright of the plaintiff. Um, so the question is, you know, the plaintiff has sought monetary damages, also forcing Von D to remove all her social media posts, prints, or online content that incorporates his photograph. Uh, no claim against the person who's actually wearing the art, <laughs> only against uh, the artist. Both parties move for summary judgment. The plaintiff sought a ruling that his copyright work has been infringed by a matter of law and Von D asked the court to determine whether or not using this photo as a reference image qualifies as a fair use. That phrase Uh, reference image rings bells, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, So the central district of California judge found that most of the contested issues should be left to the judge, such as whether or not the copyrightable elements from the photograph were used to create the tattoo, which raises our, our question and concerns of was there substantial similarity between the photograph and the new piece of artwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the judge also said, hey, I'm going to put the brakes on this until we get a decision in the Andy Warhol Supreme Court case that we've talked about um multiple times and more specific. Yeah. yeah, More specifically, we kind of did a really good rundown on the Warhol case in episode 157 Mm -hmm. last year. So, um, trial was set January, 2024. Obviously it went, it went to the jury on whether or not there was infringement, substantial similarity. And they presented to my understanding evidence of, uh, the defense of fair use. And in three hours, the jury came back and said, there's no substantial similarity between the photo and the social media post displaying the original photo in the background. Uh, Well, that those qualified as as fair use. And this verdict, I think, is probably pretty unexpected uh, by most of us because we expected it to focus on the fair use defense. Yeah, and... and Using the photo as a reference, but really it came back in the courts. The ju- sorry, the jury said we're finding non infringement. We don't even have to get to fair use except on the That's social right. media stuff because it's just not infringing. That, I mean, if you look at these images side by side, you, I mean, you, you can see the photograph in the social post that has her doing it on the guy's arm. It sure looks similar to me, more than merely a little similar. It's, I mean, I don't. If if he do, if the photographer doesn't appeal, <laughs> I'm I'll be surprised. And I, you know, I haven't. I don't know what was in what evidence went in yeah, right. as to what was a copyrightable. What were the copyrightable writable elements that mm-hmm. were used? Because I. I know just in personal experience, that's always kind of been this question when there's a reference work, you know, maybe it's, what is, it's hard to say, what's copyrightable about Mm -hmm. a picture of Miles Davis? I mean, it is the person. And so again, this goes into that whole lighting selection and and all these different things, the pose and the angle. So, 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, in this image, you know, Miles is actually putting his finger, making a shush kind of a, a gesture into the right into the eyes of the camera. And that is what you see on the tattoo as well. That selection of the pose, that's not something that Miles Davis always did or anything like that. It's not a signature look for him. The lighting of the photo is fairly distinctive and and you know, again, not just captured in natural light out in public somewhere. This was a posed image with uh, studio lighting and all that. I'm, 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 I, you can hear, I'm very surprised at this outcome, like many. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens on appeal. Was there something about the jury instruction that was defective? Or, um, or you know, maybe the jury just sort of liked Kat Von D better than Mr. Sedlick and <laughs> did their thing. Yeah, I don't know. And just as a refresher on Warhol, the, there was only one question before the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and it's whether the first fair use factor, which is the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes, weighs in favor, in that case, of the Warhol Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, their commercial licensing of the image in question to contact NAS. So, you know, it was this one factor on fair use. And obviously, the, the court in the, this tattoo case was waiting on that instruction, and I'm sure the jury instructions aligned, and yet it was a non-issue because they didn't get there. So hmm. yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Well, another case involving, I guess, what we could characterize as appropriation art um, is involves our, our friend and frequently spoken of uh, artist Richard Prince. In January uh, 25th, on January 25th, New York federal judge ruled that Richard Prince infringed on the copyright of two photographers, Donald Graham and Eric McNatt, when he used his works, their works, excuse me, in his new portrait series. And this has been a long running dispute that we've talked about before. This is where um, he took images, I think that he found on, on Instagram and blew them up onto canvases and put different captions on and, and displayed them in, uh, in get the Gagosian gallery. So the Prince and the gallery owner, Lawrence Gagosian, is ordered to pay the two photographers five times the sale price of Prince's infringing canvases. So that's about $650,000. Prince had argued that it was fair use, that his work constituted a commentary on social media and, and copyright itself in the digital age. He had argued that his work transformed the original photographs by adding his own creative elements, like comments and changes to scale and presentation. But the photographers argued, no, not transformative, doesn't constitute fair use. They argued that the prince's work was essentially the same as their photographs with only minor changes. And they also argued that prince's work didn't provide any new meaning or commentary that wasn't already present in the photos. So following the Warhol decision, the judge ultimately took the photographer's side, finding that Prince's use of the photos was not transformative enough and didn't provide new meaning or commentary sufficient uh, to uh, amount to fair use. And um, not already, you know, there was no additional commentary that would have some critical bearing on the work use itself. So. Okay. We're seeing and, I mean, the Warhol cases. Fall. 2014, yeah, and this is a 2014 when this when these when this originally act yeah. happened. So we're we're ten years mm -hmm. out, which, which is hard to believe. Well, it, it does speak to how slowly the the process works, doesn't it? it? Yeah, it does, and and he blew up obviously what would have been a, you know, depending on the size of your screen. Mm -hmm. I, I, one by one, a two by two, a three by three image yeah. on Instagram to a five foot by six foot canvases. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate, I, I think again, this was the right yeah. ruling that just changing the size there, there was not transformative. And Richard Prince has come down on the winning side of, of other transformation yeah. cases. Um, but this one just, wasn't yeah, and, it? And on this one, he has indicated that he's not going to appeal. He's he's going to take the loss. So, okay, and and hopefully learn from it. And next time he does an appropriation work, it'll be more transformative somehow. And that's right. there yeah. will be more blue paint on top of it. So that's um, actually an interesting thing where where this kind of case actually does 
what the copyright law is supposed to do to advance the progress of the useful arts and science. It's going to force him to be more innovative, more creative, and other artists as well. So mission accomplished. <laughs> and I didn't pull up what the dates were on the Rastafarian case. Something is making me think 2012. Uh, I, I think it goes back that far or nearly. Yeah. 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 So if anybody's interested, Richard Prince, there's, there, he's kind of has yeah. his own body of work. Yeah, and, and that Rastafarian case is an interesting example. Like that. Yeah, that Rastafarian case is an interesting example because that was where he was actually altering the emulsion of the print of the photograph and, and then reproducing it. And maybe that is a different kind of transformation and commentary on the nature of photography and art right. and all those things. Would be, it would be interesting to reanalyze the case in light of the, the new wall. Yeah era stuff so some law student or law professor you guys jump i was gonna say somebody who has the time and inclination yeah. <laughs> to do that we would love to but yeah. um well interesting uh case and facts un unraveling unveiling happening kind of as we come to press mm -hmm. <laughs> related to uh universal music group that's the music publishing division of universal music uh sending an open letter to TikTok earlier this year saying hey we're pulling all of our songs from your platform uh, and there's no longer going to be a partnership with TikTok. In a press release posted on the UMG website, uh, again, this is the publishing group, Universal stated that their contract renewal negotiations with TikTok had fell through mm -hmm. over concerns of inadequate pay and lack of AI protection for their songwriters and stating ultimately TikTok is trying to build a music-based business without paying fair value for the music close quote, and all of this sounds a little bit repetitive of the prior conversations and negotiations with Spotify and other mm -hmm. types of platforms that were using music without a, uh, a fair or negotiated rate for the songwriters or artists. Yeah. And saying that as to AI, the tools being developed and promoted on TikTok to alter and replicate music in ways that dissolve royalties is nothing short of sponsoring artist replacement by AI. So, you know, it, it's just kind of been a big hubbub for the last month mm -hmm. as to what's going to really happen once they've made this open statement. But now we know because within the last 24 hours of we're recording today on the 28th, um, the Universal Music Group publishing songs are coming down and it's or they have to mute them on TikTok. Yeah. So I also loved uh, the argument from TikTok, which is very reminiscent of terrestrial radio, which says, but we're giving you all this free promotional and discovery vehicle mm -hmm. for, for your talent. Gosh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> musicians and songwriters, artists, they... I, you wish you could take those exposure bucks to the grocery store or pay your mortgage with them, right? Oh my gosh, yes. I, you just we, you love some good mailbox money, yeah. but it, it's it is not happening on that setup. I mean, I understand there are some people, there are people who have been discovered on YouTube, people who well, have been discovered on TikTok, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you get this free and clear to use mm -hmm. the creative works of others. So that's the old saying, I, I that know. and a token gets you on the subway, you know? That's right. Um, so anyway, it literally hot off the presses. The, yep. the process is happening right now to mute or take down. It has broader implications than simply uh, songs that are a hundred percent universal <clears throat> is my understanding because there could have been co-writers yeah. who are with a different publisher and those may be coming down and probably are coming down as well. And, and maybe we'll talk next month that there will have been a resolution. I was going to ask, do you think this is an aggressive approach to negotiating more favorable terms in a renewal, or do you think this is a more permanent policy? I unfortunately think TikTok and the likes thereof are here to stay. So Universal as the largest publishing company in the universe mm -hmm. <laughs> is probably got the bargaining power to come up with some better terms, which I then hope those better terms trickle down to independent publishers and the rates they get paid. So, yeah, yeah.
you know, I, I, I'm concerned. Again, I have clients who are with Universal. And sure. So that's a good. That's a good thing. I have clients who are independent or with other majors. And you know what happened with Spotify is the the big players were able to go in and negotiate large upfront advances mm -hmm. that may yeah. or may not have ever trickled to that this case songwriters or I haven't heard about any artists, artists complaining about this decision by Universal to pull the songs. Yeah, I haven't I haven't heard anything either. So I mean maybe some of the new art, younger artists, the smaller artists that are looking for that exposure but uh, yeah, I don't I don't see yeah. it as being artist artists being unhappy about it. We'll see. Artists or songwriters yeah. being unhappy and the conversations I've had with independent publishers is they're very upset about the, the lack of you know, yeah. a, a reasonable rate happening mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with TikTok as well. So, well, I know our, our next case is a practice pointer for yeah. you and I and trademark professionals and people who own trademarks. Right. <laughs> so, and, and you and I both are on the trademark list serve where Pam Chestek, the subject of this story is very active. I, I don't know if you know her personally, I don't, but been following you know, this I, since I've been following it and I, I feel like I know her but maybe yeah. it's only because we're <laughs> we've been in these right. groups together for so long right well she is a, a Pamela Chestek and her her law firm uh, professional LLC is Chestek PLLC uh, she's a trademark lawyer and what's going on here is that her firm has ch had to challenge the United States Patent and Trademark Office uh, regarding an application for the trademark Chestek Legal. The USPTO had refused her application because it only provided a PO box as the domicile address, which doesn't comply with the requirement under the Code of Federal Regulations, 37 CFR, Section 2.32A2 and 2.189, for those who are care about that kind of thing. This rule is the one that mandates that all trademark applications have to have, especially those from the outside the U.S., have to provide a physical domicile address that is essentially a where you sleep at night address, not just a mailing address like a P.O. box or a, um, a private mail service. So she contended that the rules enforcing this requirement were improperly promulgated, arguing against the procedural process and the substance of the address requirement in the first place. Um, she claimed that it was done without the necessary notice and comment rulemaking, that it's arbitrary and capricious for failing to, discover, to consider the impact on privacy and other concerns. I have had clients who are concerned when their home address is listed on their trademark application, and they ask me, hey, can't I use a different, you know, whatever. It's, it's troublesome, and, and um, um, you know, especially in this day and age after after pandemic where a lot of us are now spending more of our time working from home and may have actually given up our office address and, and those kinds of things. You don't want your home address as the public record of things. Um, right. And I, you know, there's this, uh, statement conversation from the U S patent and trademark mm -hmm. office. That, well, that's, that's not going to be disclosed because you can put in your domicile address and then you can put in a mailing address. Yeah. And only the mailing address will be public. I don't think anybody has any comfort level <laughs> in that statement. I, and I, so it, it is a real concern yeah. that from a privacy standpoint. I would even that, say that the USPTO has given us cause not to trust them about this because there have been other private information things that have eventually been, you know, not behind such well-secured paywalls. and uh, Yes, the, the email, your yeah. client's email that is not supposed to be disclosed mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. when you file a trademark application that yeah. we now know is ultimately disclosed. Yeah. So her so, challenge was on <laughs> the, the procedural approach to how they passed this rule. They didn't do notice and comment, so nobody had a chance to weigh in and explain why they shouldn't require this and so on. But the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit said, you know, the PTO's decision is upheld. They affirmed that the requirement is procedurally proper and not arbitrary or capricious. The court reasoned that the requirement was part of broader regulations aimed at ensuring 
foreign trademark applicants are represented by U.S. licensed counsel to combat unauthorized legal practice and noncompliance with U.S. law by foreign entities. Okay, so we don't want some foreign applicant to just rent an, a, a P.O. box in Topeka and say, okay, this is where I live. I, we get that. Um, but anyway, it was determined that requiring a domicile address did not substantively offer, uh, excuse me, alter applicants' rights, but rather the manner in which they provide their information to the USPTO. So it's a procedural rule, and it's therefore exempt from notice and comment rulemaking. The court also found that the USPTO had sufficiently justified the introduction of the requirement as part of its effort to enforce this U.S. Council rule for foreign applicants. Any privacy concerns or potential impacts on individuals not addressed in the rulemaking process weren't I'm deemed to render, excuse me, to render um, the, the rule arbitrary or capricious as the court focused on the record available to the agency at the time of the decision making. So they, they dismissed her appeal. So right now, if you want to apply for a trademark, you have to provide a domicile address. And it's, as a practitioner, it's something I really have to drill down with the client on mm -hmm. because, again, this issue of so many of them are, you know, renting yeah. a co-work space or a, a, mm -hmm. a mailbox spot where it's, you know, yeah. one, two, three, Main Street, Suite, 60 to 85. <laughs> so, you know, you see those and realize, yeah. okay, hey, we, I know this is a mailbox. I, I've even had an issue where my client's domicile address was a, was a different law firm. And I got a call questioning that. Hmm. Wow. And I'm like, no, this is their domicile business address. Yeah. Y you know, it, what do I have to prove to you to, to show, to do that? So that's how in depth the examiners are looking at it when it's a, actually a valid street address, but they see a different business yeah. listed. There. Well, and, and it's interesting. Yeah. So the examiners are actually jumping on Google maps and things like that to verify that's is right. this address, a, you know, they have a list of, of the, uh, there's a name or a phrase for them, but the PMB uh, postal mailbox, yes. uh, you know, the mailbox, et cetera, kinds of places. Um, and so they won't allow those, but you know, they are being even more aggressive about investigating it and finding that, you know, some executive suite businesses where there's a bunch of people renting offices and a bunch more receiving mail at this location, it is the only official business address for the business. And I almost think on this one, I had to send them their secretary of state filing to oh, show that was their address official business address yeah but i mean that was their official business address and so, and most secretaries of state don't care as long as it well that's right they, they don't care know, <laughs> if it's a p.o box or whatever so hmm. yeah. um it, it is troublesome and there's no workaround i mean i think there is a policy at the trademark office where if you have a reason that you need the privacy for example uh, you know, you're, you have a protective order against your ex-spouse or something like that. You've got a domestic abuse injunction, um, or if you've been stalked and things like that, you can ask the, um, the director of the office through a special, uh, uh, request process. I forget what it's called. You can ask them to waive the requirement if you explain why, but then does that thing become a public record? And, you know, <laughs> And again, I think it's this real concern as I advise clients, you have to assume this could become public record. And mm -hmm. when what we found out is yeah. when we, the requirement went into place about the same time that you had to put in an email address for your client, mm -hmm. for the applicant, an email address yeah. for the applicant that could not be the law firm filing it. And that is blocked out or X'd out mm -hmm. when you file, but then when the application wow. registers, it becomes public because of the way in which the registration notice is sent out. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, anyway. Well, just the, the PTO hasn't public. been entirely trustworthy about their approach to these things. And so I was applauding her for, for taking the, you know, going and appealing the, the ruling and all of that. And, and, um, hoped for a different outcome, but yeah. I find myself wondering, you know, arbitrary and capricious, the finding of the court pretty, 
pretty effective there. But I find myself wondering, is there some kind of a First Amendment? And I mean, I don't think that this rule actually accomplishes the goal for eliminating the foreign applicants gaming the system kind of a thing. So, I, I you know, in constitutional scrutiny, it would get, right here we're getting rational basis. And yes, it's rationally related. But I wonder, could we come up with some kind of a freedom of speech argument that says, well, wait a minute, sure. forcing me to publish this is compelled speech. Maybe there's a strict scrutiny approach that would be more effective. I don't know. I'm not, not second well, guessing and, Pam and her team, but. And I think it comes down to finances, you know, yeah. it costs money to fight these. So sure. I, I appreciate she has put up the good fight for many, many people uh, yeah. Yeah. To, to try and bring this forward. So, mm -hmm. yeah. all right. So we've got another fair use case on copyright. Cat scratch fever time. This time. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that would be a Ted Nugent reference for anybody yeah. who didn't catch that. I, I grew up with a uh, buddy of mine, his, his name, Joe, Joe Nugent, and he always told us that Ted was his uncle. And I re believed that for a long time, but it's not true. Gotcha, Joe. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the case that just is, makes me. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a Fourth Circuit decision in a case called Philpot versus Independent Journal Review. Why don't you take it away? Yeah, so the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit just ruled that the copyright of a photograph featuring the artist Ted Nugent was the subject of a valid copyright registration, and its use in an article without proper attribution was not a fair use. So Larry Philpott is the photographer. He uh, took the image, registered it in 2013 with the U.S. Copyright Office, but then he did go ahead and share it on the Wiki Commons website under a Creative Commons license requiring specific attribution. And this is when Tamara's just going to insert a little practice pointer mm -hmm. to say using a Creative Commons license is a license. Mm -hmm. It is not equal to a copyright registration. So I'm very excited to see that our plaintiff did both. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 2016, the Independent Journal Review used this photograph in an article titled, Signs Your Daddy Was a Conservative, uh, associating <laughs> Nugent with his conservative values, but they didn't put the mandatory set forth attribution on the site. Instead, they are in conjunction with the use of the photograph. Instead, they used a link to Nugent's Wikipedia page, which then linked or connected to mm -hmm. the Wiki Commons site. So we've got kind of multiple steps removed from the attribution. Plaintiff filed the copyright infringement suit in 2020 uh, because of this lack of attribution, saying that the use was outside of the scope of the Creative Commons license and that the only remaining lawful use would have been or defense would have been a fair use. And again, the defendants claiming fair use challenged the validity of the registration, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the district court said there's a general, genuine issue of material fact as to the validity of the registration. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and granted the summary of motion for summary judgment on fair use with the uh, photographer appealing both findings. The Fourth Circuit Court circuit court assessed the fair use defense using the four-prong framework and uh, again applying the analysis from the Andy Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith that we've already talked about a couple mm -hmm. of times today and looked at this factor of transformation in nature and the commercial purpose. Despite the district court deeming the work a transformative due to its new context, the Fourth Circuit disagreed, stating that both uses shared the same purpose, which is depicting an actual depiction of Ted Nugent. And additionally, the court highlighted that the uh, journal's use was commercial and that the corporation stood to profit from that use, even though the article itself may have generated minimal revenue or income. Uh, the court went on to address the second and third prongs on fair use, examining the nature of the copyrighted work and the portion used, and it continued or concluded that both favored the photographer, uh, saying that there was no fair use. And then as looking at the impact on the potential market, the court cited a decision in Brammer versus Violent Hughes products. And I don't remember that, what that mm -hmm. case was from 2019, um, explaining that cog cognizable market harm exists when a commercial use is not transformative, but instead amounts to mere duplication of the entirety of an original. 
And I guess that's what it boiled down to. He, yeah. They just he, they took the photograph, put it on their new article, and and maybe tried to give attribution, but didn't do it appropriately. So he, here's my question to you. Mm-hmm. Let's say the photographer went through the step of the copyright registration, mm-hmm. but didn't put it up on Wicca. Wiki, Wiki Commons requiring any kind of attribution. Um, does that make a difference? I, I still infringement. Just you know, the the I guess the difference is then you're just infringing, not exceeding the scope or or, or not complying with the terms of a license. Um, I think the Wiki all the Wiki Commons does is create the possibility that there was a valid license in place had they complied with its terms, right? Right, and because they didn't comply, then we have an act of infringement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so interesting, and and they found that because the photo hadn't been published prior to registration, he had registered it as an unpublished work. I guess probably as part of a multiple image folio or something. I, I you know, anyway, um, since he had marked it as an unpublished work, there was a question of when was it published and. And that was the reason for the challenge of the registration. And the court said, no, yeah, it was unpublished. And I didn't read this, but I kind of can make some assumptions down the path of Mm -hmm. the display of the work on wiki commons in and of itself is not equal to publication. So that may have been the argument. Well, if you hadn't put it on wiki commons. Yeah. This is an interesting issue that comes up in, in the, you know, I'm seeing it coming up more often, a question of when is publication occurring? It's happening in the podcasting space as well, because most podcasts are streamed over the internet. It's made available on a website or on a, you know, through a, um, an RSS feed, whether it's downloadable or not seems to be the, a deciding factor in whether that's a publication or not. And so trying to register copyrights for podcasts right now, it's an episode by episode basis. And that is often cost prohibitive for someone who's putting out episodes every week and, you know, spending that extra, what is it, $65 to register a copyright? Yeah, is it more than fun. that now? Yeah, well, it depends yeah. on, is it work for hire? Right, is it, right. there's, there are yeah. factors that go into determining the cost of yeah. actually what, what the filing fee so is. We, so we're, we're seeing the Copyright Office making moves on the question of, well, you can do group registration of unpublished works of certain kinds and so on, but only if it's unpublished. So then what if you make it available for download? Those kinds of questions. And, and, um, it all goes back to the analysis from that, uh, I want to say about 1980 case involving the estate of Martin Luther King and the, I have a dream speech oh, with CBS that the speech was not published. Yeah, it was a performance, not a publication. And here we, okay. you were just saying, a display on the Wikicommon site, also not a publication. Not so, a publication, um, which is issues with, uh, you know, content on, on websites that mm-hmm. may be ever, <laughs> ever changing, or you have documents and do, again, do you allow people to download those documents or can they only view those documents? Mm-hmm. And all of that is, uh, a very tricky assessment as to trying to come up with a date of publication. And then I question, you know, what, what is that if you get it wrong? Because, yeah, well, because it'd be really easy to get it wrong. And there are technological questions too. If you put something on a website with contract, you know, again, with terms of service that just say, this is for you to view and, and consume, but not to download the, I mean, anybody can right click on an image on a and on That's a website, right. And download. You know? Yeah. So, it's not making it available for a download. It just happens to be the case that it is because of the technology. So right. who knows? Well, I thought the Yuga Labs board ape NFT knockoff lawsuit was over, but uh, we learned this last month, no, not the case. The battle between the artists Ryder Rips and Jeremy Cahan, uh and against y- Yuga Labs, the creators of the original board ape yacht club, NFT wasn't as over as we thought. <laughs> it begins all in in uh, May of 2022 when artists, when these two artists, uh, Rips and Can, decided to stir the pot. They launched what they called the Ryder Rips Board Ape Yacht Club (B A Y C). It was an unauthorized collection that leaned heavily on the fame and notoriety of the original uh, NFTs, the Board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, NFTs is sort of a bold thing that they did. And it obviously didn't sit well with the 
Yuga Labs, the creators of the original NFTs, and they saw it as a case of copyright infringement. They filed a suit. They they uh, um, uh, they brought the case in well last what was it twenty twenty three uh, in April of twenty twenty three. Rips and Can were ordered to pay one point five seven million dollars in damages for infringement activities, and everybody thought, okay, that's the end of it. Uh, but no. The latest court order in the case not only dismisses the counterclaims, which ranged from allegations of emotional distress, a plea for declaratory judgment of no defamation, all dismissed in this latest court ruling, and the court also significantly increased the financial award, slapping defendants now with a nearly $9 million bill for not just damages, but legal fees, expert witness fees, and disgorgement. And wow. the decision goes further. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the turnover of social media accounts. That's yeah, really. Uh, so they had Rips and Cahan were also instructed to hand over all social media accounts and the smart con smart contract, which is yeah. what is created with an NFT, mm -hmm. to Yuga Yuga Labs, uh, which you know should end all of their business activities related to these NFTs. Destroy all of the of the, the infringing NFTs and any related materials, um, everything from software, promotional items, anything that has the Board Ape Yacht Club trademark on it. Um, and hand over, yeah, I mean, it's just, that's a big, big. It, it is, and it's interesting just to kind of think about, you know, what does that, what does that destruction actually mean? You know, it, <laughs> In the past, it would have been, oh, you made all these T-shirts or you made all these yeah. records or cassettes that were infringing. And so... Off to the incinerator they go, right? Right. You know what destruction means. <laughs> yeah. And and now how does virtual destruction happen? Well, I mean, yeah. What do you do? Do you and certify really, it? And is it, really, is it really destroyed? Yeah. yeah. I guess you have to submit to a certification to the court that you've done it, you've destroyed it, and then are you in contempt if there? It turns out there's some out there still. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you. I mean, enforcing that is another story, but um, nonetheless, it, it's a powerful. The handing over the social media accounts that's easy to verify, of course. But uh, right, yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> they say they're going to appeal. Yeah, I feel a little yeah. validated that NFTs keep coming around since I made such a big deal that it would be a talking point <laughs> for all of last year. <laughs> did you invest in any? No, I did not. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> um, oh. I need to check with some of my friends' adult children mm -hmm. <laughs> in their yeah. 20s and 30s, I think, did some investments. I need to see how those are working out for them. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I know somebody who actually has a Board Ape Yacht Club uh, NFT. Okay investment but uh and even those i don't know that they're they're holding their value particularly well so they it has sort of gone off the radar for me this may be bringing it back on the radar who knows it might it might well i added to the end of our rundown another public service announcement mm -hmm. for our listeners which is a program uh through the copyright alliance which is a trade organization it's an initiative to promote diversity and copyright applications and registrations the i PDC program um, is bringing together volunteer attorneys. Uh, I'm, I'm working with them uh, through our program in Texas and sponsors from across the copyright community to encourage and support participation of black creators, indigenous creators, and creators of color in the copyright system. This is not based on uh, financial uh, status. Anyone can apply if you meet the BIPOC uh, requirements. Anyway, I put a, a link in the program if you want to see if you can qualify. Uh, and the goal is to educate program participants on the benefit of copyright registration and empower them to register their own works. As of right now, it says the program closes March 31st. I have it on pretty good information that it's probably going to extend past that. So, you know, if you uh, are a uh, black indigenous or a creator of color, or you work with uh, folks that meet those categories, have them take a look at this process through the Copyright Alliance. Again, it is very narrow in scope as far as it has to be a single author owned by an individual, not a work for hire, 
as to who can qualify. But there's no financial um, burden requirement to uh, participate. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Entertainment Law Update. And as always, we say thank you very much to you, our loyal listeners, for spending your time with us. And hopefully you share the fact that this podcast exists with your friends and colleagues and invite them to listen as well. We we love those recommendations and also your um, uh, uh, reviews and stars and thumbs ups and all those kinds of things in the various uh, podcast directories. Anything you can do to help us get more listeners, we welcome and, and appreciate that. And we also want to say thank you to our new sponsor, JD Supra, a leading platform in professional services content marketing to help lawyers turn their expertise into networking opportunities, media visibility, and new business. Find more information about JD Supra by visiting resources.jdsupra.com. And if you have feedback for us, we would welcome it. Please leave it for us using the voice widget on our website at entertainmentlawupdate.com or send us an email at entertainmentlawupdate at gmail.com. You can find us on X at, at Ant Law Update. And Tamara, how can folks find you? Yeah, on uh, so, most social media sites at Tamara Bennett, T A M E R A B E N N E T T, tbennettlaw.com or createprotect.com will take you to my website, which has been newly revamped. So oh. jump over there and take a look. If you are listening as soon as this gets posted and you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area uh, tomorrow, which is the. Uh, February 29th, I'm going to be in Fort Worth speaking uh, on AI and mm. songwriters and music publishers and artists and copyright at the Fort Worth uh, Music Festival panels. And then on Friday, if you're an attorney and you're in the DFW area, uh, I'm going to be co-presenting with attorney Daniel White at the Wealth Council Forum on uh, protecting the legacy of artists and songwriters through estate planning. So similar topic I've given before. But yeah. if you're in the area and you hear this, come come say hello. Right on, right on. Well, I'm Gordon Firemark from Los Angeles, and you can find more about me at firemark.com. The email address, gfiremark at firemark.com. And gfiremark is my handle on most social media websites. And uh, coming events for me, I'm going to be speaking... Uh, at Podcast Movement Evolutions here in Los Angeles uh, on March 27th. Uh, looking forward to that. I'm going to be doing a, a fun um, mock contract negotiation and teardown uh, along with my colleague uh, Lindsey Bowen, who's another podcasting uh, emphasized lawyer. Uh, he's from the New York area. We're going to be we're going to be tearing down a, a uh, uh, talent acquisition deal for podcast network kind of thing and that's going to be real fun and uh, and interesting and uh, let's give a shout out also to our crack team of volunteer contributors we've got john janicek our man managing editor charles thorne mark lindeman alexis allen and violet zhang all helped out with the creation of this episode along with chat gpt thank you chat <laughs> and uh hey if you are interested in joining the fun as part of the team of contributors here uh, at entertainment law update you can send us an email and law up excuse me entertainment law update at gmail.com send over a resume and a little cover note and uh, we'll get in touch with you and that's going to do it for this episode of entertainment law update thanks for listening thanks for being here and until next time that's showbiz <laughs>